believe it or not, the hardest part of designing an alternative energy system is already behind you. Now we can get into the fun stuff. It can be just about the most confusing, too. I remember when the old trip light inverters were pretty much the only inverter available. They were cranky, easily burned up, couldn't handle any surge, and they were horribly inefficient. My first real inverter was a modified sine wave inverter made by a company called Heart Interface. They were the most robust and the first ones designed for off-grid use. Then the good old trace inverters came out that revolutionized the whole industry. You had to have a shotgun to kill it. The thing could be abused like nothing I'd ever seen before. Even directly shorting the outputs would hardly phase that beast. Their efficiency was also approaching over 90%. Now, it seems like there are literally millions of different inverters out there these days. Big ones, little ones, fat ones, skinny ones, even neon colors. But we need to cut through all the glitz and glamour because what we need is a real and reliable inverter above all. As I stated in the first video, I'm not covering any utility tie systems, so I'm not discussing them here either. Utility tie systems presently are best for the power farms and overcrowded cities where individuals have few options to lower their monthly utility bills. So here was my criteria for an inverter. First, cost. I'm frugal. I don't have a lot of money, and even if I did, I wouldn't want to spend a lot of money. The second one, reliability. I want an inverter that's going to last me a long time, that can survive thunderstorms, lightning, surges, overloads, anything that I can throw at it. I want it to be mighty reliable. The third thing that I want is sine wave output. When I had the modified sine wave inverters, I had a lot of problems with battery chargers and certain stereos that were more sensitive and would have a buzzing sound in them. So I wanted a pure sine wave output. The fourth thing I wanted was high output. I needed to be able to handle my water well pump, air compressor, as well as all my other stuff. The fifth thing is efficiency. I don't want something that's going to burn up all my hard-earned watts as operating overhead. The sixth thing I wanted was charging. I want something that will take even nasty generator AC and charge up my batteries. And by the way, I also want it to pass power through to the house. I'm not asking much. The seventh thing that I want is I want it stackable. One day I might want to put 10 kilowatts of her output just for grins. The eighth thing I want is I want it remotely controllable. I want to be able to monitor the batteries and control the inverter from the comfort of my living room. And while we're at it, number nine, temperature sensing. I want to know the battery and inverter temperatures all on the remote. So, when you're considering an inverter, you'll have to find out first the surge rating of your biggest load. In my case, it's my well pump. It only draws 2160 watts but when it first starts, it surges to nearly 4,000 watts. Most of your motor-driven items are going to be your loads with surge. If it doesn't say what its surge wattage is, you can get a safe ballpark figure by multiplying its running wattage by 3 and use that for your surge rating. Make sure your inverter will handle the surge of your device. The Magnum surges to 8,500 watts for 5 seconds. That's plenty of time for a motor to start. There's one thing that no typical inverter today can do. Welding. Part of an inverter's safety and ruggedness is due to the fact that it doesn't deliver its full power when called for. It takes a little over a second for it to ramp up to full power to a level that your device requires. As the power ramps up, the inverter monitors to see how much power it's putting out. Once the power reaches a certain threshold, the inverter decides that the load is either too big or that there's a short and it just shuts down. No danger and nothing burns up. The Magnum is always shut down even before breaker trips. One thing to really watch out for is the grounding on cheap inverters. Most cheap inverters will burn out if you wire them into the mains panel and to power a house. These inverters have what is called a floating ground. In a house, the neutral wire is tied to the ground wire at the service panel. Real inverters can handle this 
and actually depend on it for both safety and lightning strike diversion. When I was building a house with my solar power in mind, I got impatient waiting for my trace inverter to come in, so I went to Walmart and bought the biggest inverter they had on the shelf. I tied it halfway through my battery bank for 12 volts and wired a plug from the house mains and plugged it into the inverter. I was only going to run a TV and lights. As soon as I switched it on, it immediately burned up. I checked the house wiring and everything was okay. So I assumed it was just a bad unit, so I returned it to Walmart and got another one. This time when I got home, I hooked it up to the batteries and plugged a light into it and the light worked. So I plugged my house mains into it and it immediately went up in smoke. Since I knew it was my fault now, I went back to Walmart and bought the last one they had. When I went home, I disconnected the ground prong wire that was plugged into the inverter from the house mains, and I isolated the inverter from the metal by placing it on a board. Then it worked okay until I got my trace inverter. I'll never buy another cheap inverter. After studying several inverters, I found out most of them are just glitzy junk. I settled on the Magnusign 4.4 kilowatt 48 volt inverter. Now I know already that I'm going to talk this inverter up real good, and this is not an advertisement, it's just me telling why I think it's the best and why I'm so happy with it. Let me just start out by saying this inverter has got to be about the most insane thing I've ever seen. Whoever engineered this thing must have lost a lot of sleep and gotten a lot of gray hair over it. It has so many features that the features have features. You can start out with a small system and grow it into a huge system. You can start out as a utility backup only, then grow to solar and wind assist, then finally move to fully off the grid. This inverter can stay with you every step of the way. For utility backup, it will keep your batteries fully charged, and when the power goes out, it will nearly seamlessly switch over to inverting mode and keep all your goodies running. When the power comes back, it charges the battery, passes the utility power through to all your goodies, and everything's still happy. For solar and wind assist, it's the same story. If the solar or wind isn't quite cutting it, the inverter will pick up the slack and keep an eye on your battery investment for you. You can program it to start and stop charging at any voltage point you wish. For off-grid, it runs my entire home with absolutely no problems whatsoever. I use it in concert with my load diversions, and I have never had it shut down because of overloading. I can program my inverter to shut down when my batteries are 15% discharged to let me know that we need to back off a bit. Then I can reprogram it to shut down at an even lower voltage and we're right back in business. I've never had that happen either, but it's a nice safety net to have in place to keep me from ruining the batteries. Replacing a full fridge of food is cheaper than buying a new battery bank. This beast is also heavy. It probably weighs 40 plus pounds. It has good heavy lugs for battery wiring and hard wired lugs for AC input and for charging and then the output for the loads also. There are several jacks on it for remote control, battery temperature sensor which is included, router for stacking more inverters and adding another 4.4 kilowatts of power, and a network interface so all the machines can talk to each other and even automatically start your generator if it has electric start. The remote control is just as packed full of features that I can access right from the comfort of my home. My battery room is about 50 feet from the house and cold snowy winter mornings are not my choice to take a hike outside to see how everything's doing. I can see the battery voltage, how much power we're using, what the inverter and battery temperatures are, turn it off, turn it on, even reprogram it right in the living room where it's nice and warm. Now to put things in perspective a bit, my Magnum inverter cost me a little over $1,600. You can go to Walmart and buy a 12 volt 100 watt inverter for about 35 bucks, but you'd have to buy 44 of those to equal the power of the Magnum inverter. You'd spend $1,540 on them. Now you're going to go broke wiring them together, they still have a floating ground, they won't give you 220 volts AC, there's no remote control, no charging capabilities, no automatic generator start, but by golly you've saved yourself a whopping $60 over the Magnum. 
but the cheapest real inverter that I found puts out 300 watts for $225. You would need 15 of those to get the same power as the Magnum. 15 of those will cost you $3,375. And this one even has the ability to handle a remote on-off button. But you'd have to have 15 buttons. I think you get the point. The best is the cheapest in the long run. It's the most practical and most robust selection. The Magnum Inverter really is an inverter that can start with you small and grow as big as your imagination and your budget will allow. So today, you learned how to choose an inverter based on your maximum load surge, not to use one for welding of any kind, and to be sure to avoid floating ground inverters. Next time, we'll look at chargers and why I chose the one that I have. Have a great week. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to leave a comment. And hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you.